Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. For those of you who I don't know, my name is Lata Palnyabin, Professor of Medicine in Cardiovascular Medicine and by courtesy of Epidemiology and Population Health. In an effort to build support and community among faculty who are interested in health equity, Stanford Medicine's Office of Faculty Development and Diversity, OFDD, hosts a number of health equity, action, and leadership, or HEAL Network events throughout the academic year. The HEAL Network goal is to highlight the work of health equity researchers and their personal journeys into their research area through a webinar series. Today's HEAL event is co-sponsored by the Stanford Center for Asian Health Research and Education, CARE, the Stanford Center for Continuing Medical Education, CME, and Stanford Medicine's Office for Faculty Development and Diversity, OFDD. I would like to welcome you all to today's HEAL webinar on Asian health disparities. Thank you for joining the over 400 registrants for today's insightful seminar. I will now introduce today's speaker. Dr. Van Ta Park is a professor at UCSF School of Nursing, Department of Community Health Systems. Her primary research interest is to address issues related to racial and ethnic minority and healthcare disparities, especially among Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander populations through community-based participatory research. Her research areas include recruitment science, mental health, and Alzheimer's disease caregiving. Dr. Park has been a longtime colleague and collaborator of many of us here at Stanford, and I am delighted to welcome her uh, back to the farm today, and I will turn it over now to Dr. Park. Thank you so much, Dr. Pali Nelpun. Um, I am just so delighted and excited to be here with everyone, and I I am just looking forward to sharing some of the work I'm, I have been engaging in uh, in along with some Stanford colleagues. And um, so I, without further ado, I believe I have about maybe 40, 35, 40 minutes and we'll have Q&A at the end. Um, so today I will be focusing my talk um, on meaningful engagement of Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander or ANHPI communities in Alzheimer's disease and related dementias research. So it's a long outline. Um, Hopefully I'll have time to briefly introduce um, each of the projects that I'm, well, these are just some of the projects, but this, each of the projects that I'm currently working on. And I will start off uh, sharing a bit about my story and who I am, given that this is a HEAL webinar and part of the goals or purpose of the HEAL webinar is to talk about our personal journeys. So... Uh, <laughs> My journey to the U.S., you can see here uh, a childhood picture of myself, the only picture we have when we, um, after we escaped Vietnam. Um, I am a refugee from Vietnam, I'm also 1.5 generation, the oldest child, the only one born outside the U.S. And just as a, I guess, interesting fact, they also the last person in the entire family to um, become a U.S. citizen. I grew up in a very traditional household, ethnically Chinese, where my grandparents actually left um, China because we were a minority in China uh, during the Cultural Revolution. And then we, my parents and I had to escape Vietnam, uh, you know, during or after the Vietnam War. And then we escaped and settled in the U.S. And I actually grew up in a primarily Spanish-speaking community. So, um, and we were, you know, low income, um, obviously uh, had limited English proficiency um, and just all these challenges and struggles that many immigrant families and refugee families had to experience. And I saw and grew up with a lot of, um, and observed a lot of mental health issues in our family as well as community. And I also knew at a very young age that there were limited resources available for people who looked like me, you know, looked like my family and lived the way we lived. 
I then decided to, oh, after I went to college and graduate school and received degrees in health education, community health, sociology, health policy, um, and at Stanford, I also received my certificate of ethnogeriatrics. I realized that I wanted to go into academia after seeing that there wasn't a lot of people, again, who looked like me conducting community-based research with in the areas of mental health and other health-related issues. Fortunately, after my master's, I also pursued, I also ended up working at three different nonprofits and community nonprofits and healthcare access, community empowerment, and health policy issues for the uninsured and underinsured. Collectively, all these experiences, personal experiences, educational uh, my interdisciplinary educational background, as well as my nonprofit community um, organization work experience, all these experiences really helped me to get to where I am today and to do the work that is so important as well and so fulfilling. Um, it is a lot of hard work, but you know, I'm just so grateful that I get to do what I get to do. So my research is grounded on a couple main things. Uh, one is that we know that A and HPI populations have unique cultural lens and experiences in how each individual or even group perceives the world. And we know our lens, then our cultural lens and experiences also then affects our health behaviors. And another thing that my research is grounded on is community-based participatory research principles, or CBPR. And what that means is we have to work with community stakeholders, community partners in every stage of research, from conception of the research issue or problem, such as, you know, having doing needs assessment together or interviews together, or even having informal talks with whether it be executive directors, local policy makers, patients themselves, and, you know, having and talk story, right? Um, and so it's really important to understand at the ground level what the issues are, what the resources are that exist in the community, and what needs to be done short term, long term. What are their dreams? You know, what are their hopes? And how can we find and marry that together with what we know about research in the field and our own respective knowledge and expertise? Um, and so how can we do that together? So it's really important to engage the community from the beginning, you know, pursuing um, and then pursuing the funding opportunities together and making sure, of course, that the community partners have adequate budgets to help, you know, meaningfully collaborate with you in the research projects. And then after that, you know, get, after getting the grant, doing the sub study implementation together, having getting feedback from them from survey design, um, informed consent, is this, does this make sense? You know, would people understand what we're trying to consent them to do or for research, for example, to evaluation, you know, program evaluation, how can we best get the data that this works or they're satisfied with the program or the study. And then also, of course, how do we retain them in research, especially if it is a longitudinal um, research study or there are follow-ups that are involved. And very importantly, to do retention. So it's I mean, not retention, to do community forums. So having organizing, coordinating together community forums, whether it be appreciation events or and or um, providing educa education on topics that are of importance to the community. So, and you always want to return the results, even at the abstract level. You know, what did we learn? Who did we recruit? And you know, reminding them how important it is for them to have a voice in research. So I'm very, very briefly going to cover or um, a little bit of background about who A and HPI uh, populations or communities are. Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial group in the U.S., comprising almost 8% of the U.S. population. And we are not a monolithic group, right? We there um, There's heterogeneity in languages, culture, 
cultural groups, immigration patterns. We're not all, for example, first generation or or in some some of us have been here for multiple generations as well. Um, diet, social economic status. The one factor or the one characteristic I really want us to bear in mind, and I think it's important to bear this in mind in our research studies with ANHPI populations is English proficiency. There's real diversity in English proficiency across ANHPI populations, as you can see here. And what that means is researchers need to make sure they recruit and budget for bilingual, bicultural staff. And that can be in, a, in collaboration with community partners as well. So you can have the community partners and their staff, for example, help with recruitment, help with screening, um, and even help with the actual study data collection. So I'm pretty sure many of us here have heard of the model minority. And as we all know, this is a myth. Um, the model minority was coined, this term was coined in the 1960s as a, really a way to, during the civil rights movement, to say that if you just work hard, you will get the results you want, right? And what the article did was they um, used, unfortunately, Japanese Americans as a way to say, look, Japanese Americans are very successful. They quote unquote, just work hard and they are doing just fine, if not better than non-Hispanic whites. Um, and therefore they don't, minorities, quote unquote minorities, racial ethnic minorities, don't necessarily need more resources or need assistance or need more rights. And as we all know, this is not true to say the least. And, um, and what this stereotype or what this myth does is um, puts all A and HPI together, first of all, and we saw in the previous slide that A and HPIs are not the same. And it perpetuates the notion that A and HPI populations are, or individuals are problem free. And when you're problem free, it then poses a, as a real big challenge for uh, researchers, for example, to make a case or an argument that um, A and HPI do need funding, do need resources. And so unfortunately, this myth remains very popular, even among uh, some ANHPI individuals. And so this myth does unfortunately contribute to the disparities we see in research participation for ANHPI populations. Um, you know, there's a seminal article that was published a few years ago, and what um, the authors, um, Dawn and colleagues did was they looked into what the NIH funded uh, in, in terms of projects that focus on ANHPI participants. And what they found was that 0.17%, so not even 1%, 0.17% of the NIH budget between 1992 and 2018 um, went to clinical research projects focusing on ANHPI participants. Um, as we clearly, this is a very sad statistic or data, right? And then in terms of Alzheimer's disease and really dementia studies, uh, less than 3% were NHPI um, individuals, and um, which is concerning given that Alzheimer's disease is, is a significant public health issue. There are many considerations um, when engaging in each bad communities to participate in research. Um, and I've mentioned them um, a little bit already. There's cultural differences, link, there's la um, language differences, but there's also a need to a budget and put aside resources to increase awareness and do outreach uh, with diverse NHPI communities about what research is and the importance of research to our targeted communities. We also need to do research or need to increase awareness and education with research communities and funders as well about why it's important to engage in outreach with NHPI communities and to help our communities reduce and eliminate health and healthcare disparities. So uh, in our, our time together the, or the rest of of our time together, um, I would like to introduce a few of the projects that I'm currently working on um, that encompasses the 
CBPR principles or, or community engaged research principles that includes cultural linguistically appropriate translations and that are innovative and pioneering. The first one is called the CARE Registry or the Collaborative Approach for Research and Education with ANHPI's um, Research Recruitment Registry. So the, the CARE Registry was originally funded by an NIH R24 and recently received an R01. We launched during the pande COVID pandemic in October 2020, and the, the main goals of CARE is to address the disparities that we um, see in uh, research participation uh, for ANHPI populations, and particularly in the areas of ADRD, aging, caregiving, and other health issues across the lifespan. More than a dozen partners and I got together and realized that we need to first, again, provide the education, engage the, with the communities about what research is, um, how we're so underrepresented, and why it's so important for us to participate in research. Um, and, and we need to do this with trusted sources of, of information, um, i.e. community partners. So the eligibility criteria for the care registry is quite simple. Uh, you have to self-identify as ANHPI, be an adult, 18 years and older, and that's because we want to be sensitive to the fact, especially with NHPI families, there are multiple, usually multiple caregivers across different age groups or generations. Uh, you have to speak and or read one of the languages here. Uh, with our new R1 grant, which we uh, call the CARE 2.0 grant, <laughs> um, we will be adding additional NHPI languages, and we hope to, uh, with an anticipated launch of spring. So please visit our website and, and sign up for, to receive our newsletter so you can be up, uh, keep updated about all the, you know, future fantastic things that will happen with the care registry. And of course, last but not least for eligibility criteria, you have to indicate that you're interested in per participating in potential research. So indicate willingness to be contacted by researchers about res um, different research opportunities. Um, we asked the registry participants about not just their social, um, socio demographics, but also health conditions, health behaviors, and caregiving experiences if um, they are a caregiver themselves. So here's a snapshot of our care participants so far, uh, because with the R24 grant, we um, you know, started off in California. It makes sense that majority of our participants are Californians, uh, but with CARE 2.0, we will strategically expand across the US. Most of our participants have uh, were born outside the US, um, many have limited English proficiency. The data or statistic that I would like to um, focus on is that 80, more than 80% of the registry participants um, reported that they have no prior research participation experience. And this is really important because it wasn't like we recruited people who already understood what research was, or are already participating in research, but you know, with academic and community partners, we did the hard work to again engage with the community, explain what research is, and why it's important to participate. Um, of course, this kind of dialogue doesn't just isn't one time; it needs to continue. So we continue to engage and um, with our participants and communities about, for example, different types of research from surveys, focus groups, cohort studies, clinical trials, etc. Um, it does take time, but uh, this is necessary to do. So he, we do a variety of retention and um, efforts, but one thing I really wanted to share is um, celebrate the fact that we, we enrolled more than 10,000 participants in our study. And we were able to create a celebrities champion celebration kind of video. And um, it's about a minute and a half, and I would love to share it right now.
I want to congratulate Care Registry for reaching the 10,000 participant milestone and to encourage our community to learn more about their vital work and how to sign up for their loved ones. Congratulations to Care Registry for reaching the milestone of 10,000 participants. And while this is a major achievement, we still have a long journey ahead of us. Please help the AANHPI community by spreading the word about Care Registry so that we can take care of our future generations to come. Hi, Richard Louie over at MSNBC and NBC News. Congratulations, 10,000 on the care registry. You know, it's easy to sign up. You can do it in seven different languages. So I'm looking forward to the next 10,000. Let's do it. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so this video is shared with our participants and our collaborators and, and will be translated as well. And we hope that 10,000 more will enroll in the registry. Um, this is just a summary of our outreach. Um, as you can see, we do it in multiple languages. And again, because it started off as a California registry, um, a lot of the outreach is has been done in California. In terms of care supported recruitment requests, so um, the way I see the registries, there's really two goals. One is to not just enroll people into the registry um, so we can contact them about potential research opportunities, but obviously researchers need to use the registry, right? Um, and so since January 2021, more than 5,500 care participants have been referred to at least one care supported studies. And these studies, we also have requests from various stages. So if you are a researcher who is writing a grant application and would like a letter of support from CARE because you plan on using CARE as a, as a registry or as a recruitment source, for your study, then please do feel free to reach out to us um, and we'd be happy to provide a lot of support. Um, you can see here there's diversity of funding sources, primarily from the NIH and um, Alzheimer's Association, but there are many pilot studies as well. And so that those pilot studies are actually the most exciting for me because um, you know it, you always have to start somewhere, right? Um, with pilot studies, um, and to learn more about our care referral process and to submit a request, you can go to our website, listen to recordings about um, you know the process, and we recently had a brain trust meeting that where we shared this. We do hold these brain trust meetings two to three times a year as well, um, but you can visit our website to learn more. We also wanted to make sure that we start to outreach to younger generations. Um, and this is something that is really important to me. I really enjoy mentoring um, undergraduates uh, as well as, as youth, and so high school students. And we wanted to provide high school and college age students an opportunity to learn more about um, research with NHPI populations and to work with care. So, and we have a program set up. So if you know of anyone um, or would like to share this with the Stanford, with Stanford University undergraduate population, um, we'd be happy to provide information about our care ambassador program. So what are the next steps for CARE? Um, as I mentioned, CARE 2.0, our one grant got funded recently and um, we are very excited to expand the registry across the US. We are going to target particularly the underrepresented ANHPI groups in the registry. We have a very um, healthy number, I feel, of Vietnamese, Chinese, Korean participants, in, especially in California. But we need to do a better job outreaching to um, South Asian or Asian Indian populations, um, Filipino population, Japanese, Native Hawaiian, Samoan, etc. So we are partnering up with many additional partners, community and academic partners in this regard. 
We're also going to examine re registry participants' research attitudes in participa participation in health research and their willingness to participate in diverse research. So we're going to add more questions to the enrollment survey. And we're going to examine and develop methods to improve the re registry retention. Um, this is all related or in the area of recruitment science, um, which is a flourishing field. And I'm very excited to be working in that area. And of course, we'll continue to promote the use of the registry. So um, in the next several slides, I'm very briefly going to introduce some of the other work or studies that I'm involved in. Asian cohort for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, next slide, please, is a study that is uh, started off with R56 funding and now has received U19 funding. ACAD is the first Alzheimer's disease cohort study focused on Asian American and Asian Canadian older adults. And as you can see in the uh, map here, we have a number of recruitment sites, including Stanford University. And our goal is to develop more reliable AD or Alzheimer's disease diagnostics, more accurate risk predictions, including AD biomarkers. And we are hopeful that with all the new knowledge from ACAD, it will lead to better treatments and health delivery for older Asian American, Asian Canadian populations. And we have so far enrolled almost a thousand people into the study. Similar to CARE, we use CBPR um, in our research, we, um, which is really important, especially with older uh, Chinese and older Vietnamese Korean uh, adults who have a higher proportion of limited English proficiency. And we um, engage, use the World Health Organization translation framework uh, to conduct our translations. It's a very rigorous uh, translation process, but it results in much better culturally and linguistically appropriate uh, study materials. So both ACAD and CARE, we have animated videos that I encourage you to visit on our website. You can see, and this is with community input, um, uh, we wanted to have different ways to conduct outreach, um, in including using um, animation. We also um, design and send uh, different e-cards during holidays. Uh, and then we also provide um, a hard copy or of the e-card or we mail these um, cards to those who do not have email addresses. So not everyone in our study uh, have email addresses or have access to digital technology. So, um, or, or they have limited um, knowledge about how to use uh, digital technology. So we want to make sure we provide um, these cards to them as physical cards as well. So the next study I like to just share or project is called kimchi. <laughs> um, many of you maybe eat kimchi. Um, it, kimchi stands for Koreans invested in making caregivers health important. And we work with uh, two major community partners who serve uh, Korean Americans, including older Korean Americans, uh, the Somang Society and the Asian American Resource and Information Network. Um, so the purpose of Kimchi is to develop culturally tailored health education for Korean American caregivers and other stakeholders in the Korean American community. And what we do is we take what is in the evidence-based literature, um, particularly for this kimchi project now, we are taking PCORI evidence-based um, research. We are culturally, linguistically adapting the learnings of those projects and sharing the important messages um, to our community, our Korean American community. Um, and so last year we focused on dementia caregiving and healthy cognitive aging. And this year we're focusing on advanced care directives. Okay, so I already shared this, but uh, uh, I mean the topics, but you can see here that uh, we have the different types of outreach and dissemination we have done for kimchi. And kimchi 
really exist because there's limited um, resources available for Korean Americans, including caregivers and older Korean Americans on these various health topics. And it's really important to provide this health education, provide this community engagement as a base before we um, design, for example, a caregiver intervention um, with Korean Americans. So we do plan on continuing to um, do work um, with kimchi and we'll think about our next steps even after a PCORI funding is completed this year. Okay, so our family journey is, next slide please, is a project that focuses on Vietnamese American dementia caregiving. And this was the first um, project of its kind in, in the US. And this was something that is was and is near and dear to my heart. Um, as I do have a family member who has a mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's. And this is, again, a project that we took. We took actually Dr. Dolores Gallagher Thompson, who is uh, emeritus faculty at Stanford, and we culturally tailored uh, her evidence-based psychoeducational program for our Vietnamese American dementia caregivers. Our program participants really appreciated this program learned a lot and we and it was very successful. And we have plans to um, uh, scale it up because this was a pilot study funded by the Alzheimer's Association. And you can see here, we um, try to, of course, use people from the community and you know developed materials that are appropriate for our participants. I believe this could be our, my last slide or last study. Asian Americans and Racism, Individual and Structural Experiences is a recently funded study by the NIH, next slide, to look at the role of multi-level multi structural racism and discrimination and how that is tied to the uh, risk in or for Alzheimer's disease or for cognitive decline. Um, and we're going to uh, recruit 500 people, next slide please, across California and including the Bay Area. Uh, we're, and the participants will include older Chinese, Korean, and Vietnamese adults. We're going to ask a set of cognitive questions and other functional tests. And we're also going to do a blood draw, particularly to look at um, AD biomarkers. And we are in the early stages, but we hope to launch in the next two to three months. I just wanted to summarize some overall lessons that I have learned and continue to learn. Um, I mentioned translation takes a lot of time and effort. I do not encourage, or my rec major recommendation is not to use Google <laughs> um, and to really recruit people who know the languages, know the nuances of the language, taking into account regional, political kind of issues at hand when you think about how to translate, you know, English text to Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, and other languages. It's really important to have a community advisory board. You know, they can be your sounding board. They can be your partners to do recruitment with. They can, you know, uh, really encourage you also uh, to think about things that you might not have considered before in the research design, implementation, and evaluation. We need to continue to remove the barriers to research participation. Um, if you want to do research with NHPI community, especially those with limited English proficiency, you have to budget for it, right? Um, and you have to recruit staff who are proficient in the language, language and who are sensitive and aware about how to work with the populations you want to work with. I also had mentioned how, you know, some ideas to work uh, in the areas of digital technology. You need to be creative on how to, you know, I know it's very easy and convenient to uh, work with populations or participants who know how to use Zoom, for example. But um, if in the work I do in Alzheimer's disease, for example, to when you're doing, um, trying to collect cog cognitive data, um, not everyone knows how to use Zoom or, and so 
um, you are going to get, um, there's going to be limitations on the generalizability of your data if you only recruit people who know how or who are proficient on how to use um, digital technology. You also need to compensate your community partners and participants um, adequately and well. It takes time to do all this work. They, community partners have a wealth of knowledge, experience, connections, and we need to not take advantage of that and ask them to do things for free. Um, so we need to appropriately compensate them for their time and effort. We also, as researchers, need to be a resource to the community. So when we get asked to come out to do a community forum or to uh, help table and uh, help, you know, have a table at their resource event or, or asking, if they ask us for volunteers to assist them in things in our areas of expertise, we need to be ready and we need to show up. You know, it's a two-way street and that's uh, and we need that's how you can have a true partnership as well. And I just want to thank um, everyone who's involved in the research projects uh, as well as the funders, uh, uh, NIH and PCORI um, and Stanford University again for inviting me to present today. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Park. As expected, there is a number of questions um, based on your engaging talk. Um, and so I'll group a few of them so we can answer as many as possible. Uh, we have some questions from Yoon Choi and CJ Kalange about uh, strategies for recruitment. Um, so they were wondering if you could share some examples of the strategies to recruit more participants out of California for the CARE project. And how did you advocate the care registry to get more participants? And how did participants hear about the registry? What does outreach look like? Was it mainly word of mouth? So I wonder if you could say a few words about that. Thank you. Um, so I'll try to remember all, all those questions. Um, so we, the, as I said a little bit, our, the care registry was launched during the pandemic, which was not our plan. And I think for many of us, it wasn't our plan <laughs> to do um, research during that time. Uh, and so we did have to pivot in, in doing some remote, if you will, kind of outreach. And I learned so much through our community partners at that, during that time, I honestly wasn't really sure how we were going to do recruitment, um, remotely. Right. And so, and our goal was to recruit 10,000 people, um, into the registry. We have community partners who did the hard work from phone calls to teaching their community members how to go on Zoom with very clear instructions to using other platforms like uh, phone chat apps, right? You know, um, as in using those video features instead of Zoom when you need to see them to Facebook Live to recordings of YouTube. Um, things like that. So we th that's how we were able to engage them and continue to somewhat engage them um, in new participants, especially that way. But for sure, now that everything's back to normal um, in, and we do do a lot of in-person outreach at community fairs, cultural events, and media partners are really important as well. Um, and so one of the attendees asks, at what stage of research do you disseminate research to the general AA and HPI community? For example, do you wait until you've published a paper or formal report, or do you share preliminary findings or conference abstract? That's a very good question because uh, as we know, we we don't want to share everything until things are published. But bear in mind that I, for many community members, they don't need and what may not understand, depending on their background, all the intricacies of our typical research papers, right? Depending on who your target populations are, you know, the way you disseminate research findings will will be unique or would vary. But in general, try to think about it, uh, try to disseminate the research in lay communities or lay language, community um, language. And what would, um, again, this is where working with community partners would be important. Does this make sense? You know, providing the overall, like this is the number we recruited, reminding them what their goal, the goals of the study is, 
What are the next steps? How can you continue to be engaged? And what kind of difference are you making or did you make? Um, we have a appreciation event for one of our studies tomorrow, and uh, our, re our participants think of it as a party, <laughs> which is fabulous. They're like, oh, I'm going to a party, yay, you know, and so we're going to have that really big event in the Vietnamese American um, Service Center, um, and we are going to have raffles, we're go and we're going to present a summary status of this cohort study that they continue to participate in. And we're also gonna use that as an opportunity to introduce new studies that they could participate in. So dissemination will, can occur that way. I would, we also create brief reports, which can be disseminated not just to participants, but to funders and, and other organizations and even news media. Wonderful. And that's such a great example of um, community-based participatory research strategies. So thank you for being such a leader um, in that in academics as well as the community. So last question is asked that the term AANHPI community encompasses a wide range of diverse ethnicities and cultural differences. Considering their different socioeconomic situations, how do you address the challenges associated with such a broad categorization? For instance, are Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders included when you are collecting data from specific ethnic groups within this community? Just to clarify is the question how to bear, be sensitive and bear in mind the diverse um, social economic backgrounds of NHPI populations. Yes, this is something we, um, it, it's very important to remind <laughs> um, people, and this goes back again to the um, how unfortunately ANHPIs get lumped together, right? Um, there's diversity in many different factors, including economic status um, or economic backgrounds, I should say. And so I think in general, when ANHPI individuals or participants are included in research studies, they are English speaking and have high SES or high social economic status, which we know doesn't necessarily reflect who all ANHPIs, right? So it's important to, and this is one of the lessons or things I shared, that it's important to provide participant incentives. When you have um, also the research study, have, you know, food there that they, that is, that they would enjoy or be be familiar with, provide reimbursements or provide transportation for them as well, um, whether it be in the form of paying for their Uber Lyft or making sure whatever recruitment site that you have is next to public transportation, make it easy. And this is something we always keep in mind. And that way we can help minimize the challenges with recruiting people from um, lower uh, social economic um, status backgrounds. Great, well, thank you, um, Dr. Park, on behalf of all of us at Stanford. We had many questions about whether your talk would be available and uh, want to let the participants know that this talk has been recorded and will be available on the Stanford CME YouTube channel. So please look out for that. Thank you all for your engagement. We look forward to providing additional opportunities um, to talk about health equity throughout the year. The Stanford Medicine Heal community shares knowledge, resources, and support with the goal of working toward health equity. In the community, people are a powerful for force for transformative change, so thank you. Um, we invite you to both build and take part in the Heal community. 